is in Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Uh, I'm teaching tonight when you read a verse of Scripture, read it and ask the Holy Spirit to break it down for you. Now, <clears throat> let's look at this Scripture in Jude 1, 1 14. It was of these people, moreover, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with his mitrade of holy ones, 10,000 of his saints. That's quite a number. That's us, saints. Say, I'm a saint. Yes, you're a saint. God made you a saint. Now, read that scripture now. <clears throat> Uh, the Lord's coming, number one. Uh, Who is he bringing with him? Somebody tell me. Point to yourself. The saints, okay. So we see that he's coming, and he's coming with ten thousands of his saints. Okay. Now, other scriptures bear witness to that. When you read over in Revelation, about, uh, Revelation 19, about the Lord coming, uh, these people on white horses, you remember when you read that, and, the, and they got these white gowns on, and they're riding these uh, white horses, you know, and they're coming back to earth, see. So if you're coming back, you've got to get up there. Some, at some place, we have to get up there if we're going to come with the Lord back. So notice he's coming. But what is he coming to the earth at this time? Let's look at the next verse, 15. So we see he's coming. And he's coming with ten thousands of his saints. And what is he coming for? To execute judgment upon all and to convict all the impious unholy ones of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the severe abuses, jarring things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, that's, that's as clear as you can get. Now, we're going to talk about the, the, the rapture. The resurrection of the saints. When you read that in Thessalonians, Paul is talking to the Christian people of that day and, 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 and saying, let me tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And uh, those that are alive at that time those that have died prior to, to this moment of time, they're going to rise first and we're going to be all of a sudden caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So he's talking about the resurrection there. It's nothing to do with judging the world. So we have to see that in the scriptures. Now I may be losing you already, but you have to understand that the rapture is totally different than the second coming. The rapture is the resurrection of the saints. Those that, have prior, those that have died, that is, their bodies are resurrected. And then we that are alive are resurrected. They talked about the second coming because the second coming, he's coming back to, for judgment to the ungodly people. But he's also coming back also at that time when you read in the scriptures. He's coming back to save Israel, because at that time, Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by all the nations, and they're coming against the Jewish people, and he's coming back with the saints, with us, and he's going to save Israel. So you have to see the second coming different than the resurrection, or what we call the rapture. How many of you understand what I've said so far? Okay, that's good. I want you to see that because I'm going somewhere with this. So here we see in, in verse 14 that he's coming back with 10,000 of his saints. Why is he coming back here, which is basically the second coming of Christ? He's coming to execute judgment upon the ungodly people that have rejected his grace and his mercy. Okay? And he's going to, and he's going to deal. Now that's one reason that he's coming, and we find in other scriptures uh, other areas also. Now let's turn to First um, Thessalonians four thirteen. First Thessalonians four thirteen. Now look what how Paul's talking here. 
He said, now also we would not have you ignorant brethren and sisters about those who fall asleep in death, that you may not grieve for them as the rest do who have no hope beyond the grave. So when you read that, what is he talking about? Number one, he don't want us to be ignorant. Okay. About those that, that, that is our loved ones that have pre previously passed away and died. He doesn't want us to be ignorant about that or grieve for them. Because they, they, they really aren't there. They, their spirits are in heaven. Okay, we got, see, we have that picture. That's why you've got to read a lot of the scriptures to be able to formulate in your mind what Paul is talking about. So he's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about the resurrection. How many say that? He's talking about the resurrection of the dead first. But there's another mystery in all of that, which uh, in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 15 talks about, Paul says, I'll show you a mystery. Okay, that wasn't known before. It wasn't known until God gave the apostle Paul the revelation of that mystery. Keep that in mind. So now, he don't want us to be ignorant about those that have died. He don't want us to grieve like the rest do who have no hope. Now, who are those that have no hope? Well, I'll tell you, if you don't know. Those are the people that have rejected Christ. How many see that? Okay, they have no hope. Those are the people that when, when, he, when Christ comes back with the saints and he's going to judge them, execute judgment upon them, that, that's, that's who he's talking about there. So when you read that scripture, we find out that the New Testament calls death a sleep. You just go to sleep. How many has been with somebody that has just passed, is passing away? Okay, and it's just go to sleep. Okay, now, so we, we see that scripture and we, and we break it down. So people outside of Christ have no hope whatsoever of, of, of the resurrection whatsoever uh, and to be uh, uh, able to go to heaven because they rejected God's grace. Now, look at the next verse, verse 14. For since we believe, I'm talking about we Christians, believe that Jesus died and rose again. How many believe that? Okay. Even so, God will also bring with him those Jesus, though, uh, with him through Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in death. So we believe that Jesus died and rose. And what else do we believe in that? That he will bring with him those that have fallen asleep, which we read over in Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. You see that? Or, or 14. 10,000 saints came back. Okay, they were resurrected. So we believe that Jesus died. We believe that Jesus uh, rose again. Look what he says. Even so, God also will bring with him through, those, through Jesus those whom have fallen asleep in death. Okay? So we know that, that uh, they're not in the grave. Where are they? What does that scripture tell you? They're in heaven. So Jesus is going to bring them with him those that have fallen asleep we know that their spirits are in heaven so they're going to come back and claim their bodies okay all right let's go to the next verse 15 for this we declare to you now paul's talking and he said now we're, we declare this to you you christians here on the earth by the lord's own word that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way proceed into his presence or have any advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him in death. So basically Paul is saying those that had previously died will rise first, 
that we that are alive, and he explains that, will be caught up with them. In other words, we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye to meet the Lord in the air, okay? Now, we're talking about the resurrection. We're not talking about the second coming of Christ here. Remember over in uh, Jude chapter 1, we're talking about he's coming. The second coming, he's coming back for what? Somebody tell me. Who remembers what I just said? Judgment. If I say judgment, all right, all right. We've already been judged. Christ took our judgment at the cross. Okay, so 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 try to clear all that in your mind. So he tells us something. Now let's go to the next verse. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a, a loud cry of summons, with the shout of an archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God. And those who have departed this life in Christ will rise first. So my father and mother, their bodies in the grave, their spirits are in heaven. Christ is coming down. Dad and mom's coming with him. And their bodies are going to rise first out of the, out of the ground be, and, be, and become a glorified body. And their spirits will unite. Dad and mom's spirits will unite with their glorified bodies that I'm alive at that time, and instantly, I'll be, as they go up, I'm changed, and I go up with the Lord at the same time. Everybody got that picture? All right. All right, now, let's go to the next verse. Then we, that is, the living ones who remain on the earth, shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected dead. So we're talking about resurrection here. We're not talking about second coming of Christ for Christ to judge the world or to judge the wicked people. We're talking about a resurrection here. See, people get it all mixed up, see. So let's move on a little bit further. The resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so always through et the eternities of eternities, we shall be with the Lord. Now, so we're up there. Now, those people back over there in Jude, chapter 1, verse 14, when Jesus is coming to the earth to pass judgment upon the ungodly, who's with him? Come on, who's with him? Yeah, nobody's going to raise your hand. Yeah, we are. I want you to see the picture. We're coming back with him, see? Yeah, and, and so... We're not talking about the resurrection there. This is the resurrection that we're talking about here. Okay, so let's move on now. Next verse. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words. And that's what we're to do. Brother, I want to encourage you. One day you're going to be changed. I know you're good looking down. You're like me. You're good looking. Everybody say amen. amen. Look at all of you, brother. I agree with that. Because you're made in the image of God. You got to be good looking. <laughs> so so that, that is our hope. In the twinkling of an eye. But those that have died previously, their bodies will be raised first. Then we that are on the earth at that time will be instantaneously changed and resurrected and go up to be with the Lord. So encourage one another. So when you see me, sometimes encourage me with that, would you? Okay. Now, let's turn over to um, 1 Corinthians 15. Boy, now this whole chapter is... Uh, oh, I wish I had time to... Uh, Appreciate it, but we don't. I want to start with, um, let's see. Okay, let's, let's turn to uh, 15, uh, 12. We'll start with 15, 12. <clears throat> and now, in, if Christ the Messiah is preached as raised from the dead, that's what we preach. How is it that some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
Now he's talking to people back in his day, and you have people today that they don't believe uh, in the resurrection. And he and Paul is saying, well, how, how do you how do how do you how, you, how are you saying that? You know, if Christ was raised, and now you, you're saying that there is no resurrection, he's sort of getting after him. Next verse. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. Now this is a, a, an important doctrine that we need to believe in. Because if there is no resurrection, Christ hasn't risen. And if he hasn't risen, what are we doing here? I mean, we might as well turn the building into a honky-tonk and have a good time. You see what I'm talking about? If we have no eternity out there, no hope, that's what the world believes. That there is no resurrection. Then Christ is not, hasn't risen. And if he hasn't risen, we're still in our sins. And Paul brings that up in this chapter. All right? So, let's move on with the next verse. And if Christ has not arisen, then our preaching is in vain. Us being here tonight is in vain. This is all in vain. How many see that? So you've got to see what the scripture says now. It's, it's, it amounts to nothing. It amounts to nothing. All that we're doing here tonight and what we've been doing all these years, reaching uh, people for, uh, uh, for Christ, it's nothing. If there's no resurrection, we're just blowing wind. All in vain. Nothing. That's what he says. It amounts to nothing. And your faith is devoid of truth and is fruitless, without effect, empty, imaginary, and unfounded. See how important it is that our faith is grounded in this truth about the resurrection. All right, let's go to the next verse now. We are even discovered to be misrepresenting God. For we testify of him that he raised Christ when he did not raise in case it is true that the dead are not raised. So Paul is saying, then, then uh, we're, we're misrepresenting the whole nine yards here. If God hasn't raised Jesus from the dead, we're just blowing air. That's all we're doing. Next verse. I'm paraphrasing it there. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. They're anchored together. You can't, you can't separate them. He lives because he lives, we live. He was resurrected and we were resurrected with him. Remember that already as far as God's concerned. So Paul is trying to get a lot of people in that day and even today get their minds straight on this subject about the resurrection. All right, go to the next verse. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is mere delusion, futile, fruitless, and you are still in your sins under the control and penalty of sin. Just let that soak in. But thank God he has been raised. But Paul is saying if he hasn't, then we're still, we're still in our sins. We have no hope. Everything we're doing is a delusion. Hot air. So he's setting up that picture for people to see that there is a resurrection. All right, go to the next verse. And further, those who have died in spiritual fellowship and union with Christ has perished are lost. Talking about our loved ones that believed in Christ and, and they passed away, they lost. If there is no resurrection, they lost. How many see the picture? He's painting the picture here now. All right, let's go to the next one now. If we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, then we are of all people most miserable and to be pitied. How many see that? Now let's go over it again. So if we are abiding in Christ have, and have hope only in this life, We're just miserable folk. But thank God there is a resurrection and we do have a hope. And that hope is the hope of eternal life 
throughout eternities of eternity. So let's move on to the next verse now. But the fact is that Christ the Messiah has been raised from the dead, and he became the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep in death. So now he's coming back and saying, let me tell you the truth. The truth and the fact is that Christ the Messiah has been raised from the dead. Praise God. Now we have great hope. That's what we are to believe. Go to the next verse now. But since it was through a man that death came into the world, it is also through a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. We know that because of the disobedience of one man, Adam, we all became sinners. But because of the obedience of one man, we have all been made righteous. Okay? Uh, death came and then sin came and that separated us from God. But you know, God uses death to usher uh, in, us into the presence, into his presence. Have you ever thought about that? How many wants to be in, uh, in the presence of the Lord? All right. How many is ready to die right now where you can be in the presence of the Lord? Charles might be raising his hand. The rest of you didn't raise <laughs> Gotcha! <laughs> Why fight it? <laughs> I, I want to say that again. <laughs> Sin came into the world and therefore death came and it separated us from God and yet God uses death <laughs> to bring us into his presence. And everybody says, oh, I want to be in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Get my gun out. <laughs> Cock it. <laughs> How many see the picture? I, you, know, you, you need to see the picture that, that, that we think death is the most harmless thing in the world. No, that is what is going to uh, allow us to get out of these bodies and be in the presence of the Lord. What did the Bible say? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And he goes on and says, now as long as I'm in these bodies, and he, Paul makes it a little, he's talking to himself here. Uh, well, you know, to die is gain, uh, but it's necessary that I stay. That's in Philippians, by the way. Uh, it's necessary that I stay here for you guys, but really I would rather go on to be with the Lord. Say, and so you're not there yet, and that's okay. You've got things you want to do. But there'll come a time that as you get older, uh, you'll be ready to, to, to go to be with the Lord. You're ready, you'll be ready to give up all your things you've worked all your life so hard for. <laughs> yeah, that, that Cadillac, and, yeah, that brand new stove you just bought. <laughs> it's all going to stay behind. All right. So... For since it was through a man that death came into the world, it is also through a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. All right, go to the next verse. But for just as because of their union of nature in Adam, all people died. So all people died because we all came from the same root. We came from Adam. All of us, all the way down to where we're at right here, right now. So also by virtue of their union of nature shall all in Christ be made alive. Now that's good news. And he did it all for us. Is it my fault that I'm a sinner? Think it through. Is it your fault that you were born a sinner. No. It wasn't. You inherited that. See? From Adam. Came all the way down in our DNA. Came right on down. See? So it is through one man that we were separated from God, which was Adam, and then, praise God, because of one man, Jesus Christ, we shall all be made alive. He's talking about the resurrection there. Be made alive. We'll be resurrected. 
Powerful, powerful. All right, let's go to the next verse. But each in his own rank and turn, Christ the Messiah is the first fruits. Then those who are Christ's own will be resurrected at his coming. So when he comes for the saints of God, then we will be resurrected at that time. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we that remain are on the earth. Right now, it could happen. Uh, the dead could go up and <laughs> we could just leave this place right here. Wouldn't it be awful that, that that happened right now and you were left behind? How many has that fear? You shouldn't, don't have it. That's why I'm preaching. I want you to be concrete in the, this fact that Christ will make us alive at his coming and we will go up. But there'll be a lot of people in a church setting, if it happened, there'd be a lot of people. Some preachers would be still preaching, <laughs> be up there preaching because they have not been born again. When you've been born again, it, it, it's, how many in here know that you're alive right now? How many in here tonight know that you are alive right now? How many in here knows that if you quit breathing right now, you would leave your body just like that? How many knows that? You say, All right, how do you know that? There's some things that, that we know because God reveals it to us. How? By his spirit. Amen. See, a lot of things that we know, we know by him revealing it. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what the Lord has prepared for us. But he has revealed it, that he has revealed it unto us. How? By his spirit, the Holy Spirit reveals these things. I know I'm saved. I know that, that when this body quits functioning, I'll be with the Lord, just like that. Absent, present, okay? How many is ready to go right now? One, one two. <laughs> I got four people on that one. I got four on this side, this, this side. <laughs> I'll have to keep preaching here. <laughs> I know you're thinking about that submarine you got in the refrigerator. I know. <laughs> you don't want to leave it behind. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, here we go. So we'll be resurrected at his good. When he comes, we'll be resurrected. Okay. Next verse. After that comes the end, the completion, when he delivers over the kingdom to God the Father, after rendering inoperative and abolishing every other rule and every authority and power. So when the church is resurrected, you've got, those, you've got the uh, tribulation years, you've got the second coming. It's all, say when you, when you read the scriptures, there's time element. You've got to put the time element in there. Sometimes it seems like it's all together. How many of you know we've been at, at, at the end? We've been at the end of time for two thousand years. When you read uh, Hebrews, in these last days, the Lord has. Oh, the last days. That was two thousand years ago. So we're in the last days. So time is nothing uh, to God. Nothing whatsoever. But to us. We're conscious of, of time element, you see. But he's in that fourth dimension. We're in this third, more or less, dimension. But anyway, so let's go to the next verse. For Christ must be king and reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So we wonder, what's taken the Lord so long? Well, there's some things that are happening in the world today and his enemies are going to be placed under his feet. So everything in its time, the first fruit, and then the others come along in the resurrection of time. Let's move on to the next. The last enemy to be subdued and abolished is death. I'm going to read over in Revelation here in uh, 21 verse, starting with verse 1. Put Revelation, and we'll come back to that. Revelation 
21, verse 1. And John is talking. Then I saw a new sky, heaven, and a new earth. For the former sky and the former earth had passed away, vanished. There, and there no longer exists any sea. So as far as this world is concerned, there'll be a time when there'll be no more sea. Now I'm sure there'll be lakes and rivers and things like that. But when you think about the sea, how much sea covers this earth, that's a lot of land. Can you see that? And all the seas are gone. So you've got a whole lot more land for people to live on. Let's go to the next verse now. Now, John is talking about what he saw in his spirit. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautified and adorned for her husband. All right, next verse. Then I heard a mighty voice from the throne, and I perceived its distinct words, saying, See, the abode of God is with men, and he will live in camp tent among them, and they shall be his people, and God shall be personally be with them and be their God. So there's a day in, in the near future in which there'll be a new heaven, a new earth, and the new Jerusalem will come down. God will live with man. We'll live with him. He'll live with us. He'll abode with us. Because, see, we always see salvation from our viewpoint. But we don't see it from God's viewpoint. God started all of this. He wants us as a family. He's a father. A father wants a family. And so all of this is about God more than us. God created man for his pleasure. Revelation 4, uh, 11 says that. Everything has been created for his pleasure. We've been created for his pleasure. And we look at it that he's for our pleasure. <laughs> but we got to see that God has some desires and some wishes. And that is for all of us to be, all of God's, his creatures to be saved and that he will live among them. Go to the next uh, verse. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be anguish, sorrow, and mourning, nor grief, nor pain anymore. For the old conditions and the former order of things have passed away. So everything that we see and know here will all one day be gone forever. No more sorrow, no more of this. People, people uh, ask that question, well, why do people have to suffer? Well, there's quite a few uh, answers to that. Sometimes we suffer because of our own disobedience. Sometimes we suffer because of other people's disobedience. Uh, many times we have to suffer because the enemy has come to kill, to steal, and destroy. There's many different reasons why we, we have to suffer. But there'll be no more of that. When God makes everything new, he'll be right here with us. And it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a total different atmosphere. And we, it'll be, it'll be a, a great time. All right, the next verse. And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. Also, he said, Record this, for these sayings are faithful, adequate, accurate, and incorruptible, and trustworthy, and true, and genuine. Now, when I read, when I read all of that, that's a promise in the future. So I read all the way back in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and with all the different prophecies that have come forth, so far, I can say yes, 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 yes. They've all come true. All come true. The Jews coming back into the land has come true, and they're still coming back into the land. All the different prophecies that we read in the Old Testament, also the different prophecies that Jesus said. I don't doubt the resurrection. I don't doubt a new order of things is all going to be just like God said. But our job right now, and we know what our job is as the bride of Christ, as the church, is to serve him and reach for souls and bring many souls into the kingdom of God. All right, let's move on to that next verse, back to Corinthians. 
Back into Corinthians. Well, that's a good verse to read. Okay, there we are. Go to the next. So, see there, subdue and abolish is death. Well, we read that over in Revelation uh, chapter 21, verse uh, 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 1 through 7, didn't we? that he, death will be, be gone. All right, go to the next verse now. For he, the Father, has put all things in subjection under his, that is Christ's feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it is evident that he himself is accepted who does the subjecting to all things to him. So we become subjected to him when we submit to him and follow him, okay? Many things are not uh, subject to him because people refuse to obey and will not accept him. But we have accepted him, so we've been made subject to obey and to follow him. All right, go to the next verse. However, when everything is subject to him, then the Son himself will also subject himself to the Father, who puts all things under him, so that God may be all in all, be everything to everyone supreme, the indwelling and controlling factor of life. Next verse. Otherwise, what do people mean by being themselves baptized in behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now, the, the Mormons do that. They, uh, if somebody dies, they can, they'll take one of their cousins or one of their people and baptize them because they think baptism saves you. Paul is not saying that that's right. He's saying that that's what some people were practicing in that day, and they were practicing that because they believed that there is a resurrection. So otherwise, what do people mean by being themselves baptized in behalf of the dead? If someone in their family died, uh, they think, well, I'll go ahead and be baptized as an epoxy for them, and I'll be water baptized, and that, that'll save them. Well, we know that ain't true when you read the Scripture. How many of you understand what I'm saying? I know that's a little confusing, but you you got to see that that, that 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 is really not true. Let me say something. Everything in the Bible is not truth to live by. But it is truthfully recorded. How many caught it? You work it. It's hard to catch, isn't it? Everything in the Bible is not truth to live by. Judas went out and hung himself. You going to live by that? It's truth, truly recorded for us to see that he went out and hung himself. But it is not a truth to live by. How many understand it now? Okay, so remember that. You've got to... The Bible says, study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the truth. You've got to divide this truth, okay? And it takes the Holy Spirit operating in our lives to understand some things. Because you can go out off on a legalistic road, or you can go off too far to the left, to the right, whatever. You, there's a truth. These, many of the truths in here, they're truthfully recorded, but they're not truth to live by. All right, everybody got that? All right. Now, let's go to the next verse. That's not truth to live by, by the way. That's truthfully recorded because he want, he's asking a question. Why are, you, why are you guys baptizing people for that it's already died? You know, baptism don't save you. If you did, we'd go out there and drag them in here and baptize them. For that matter, why do I live dangerously as I do, running such a risk that I am in parallel every hour. Now Paul is saying, listen, if there is no resurrection, why am I going through all of this? I mean, I'm, people are trying to kill me. The, 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 all this is happening in my life. Why am I doing that? If there is no resurrection, because I'm in peril every hour. Dangerously, all of this is happening. Why am I doing that? Because I know there's a resurrection, see? Why are we here tonight? Because we know there's a resurrection. Why are we here tonight? Because we know that we've been born again. It's been revealed to us by the Spirit of God in His precious Word. 
And so he goes on a little bit with that discussion about these people saying that <clears throat> there is no resurrection. Remember, he's dealing with these people now. And for that matter, why do I live dangerously, Paul is saying, as I do, running such risk that I am in peril every hour. But I know there is a resurrection, Paul is saying. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. All right, go to the next verse. As I assure you by the pride which I have in you, in your fellowship and union with Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily, I face death every day, I die to self. Daily. Anybody had to die today? <laughs> you might as well get used to it. Because the reason that a lot of people have a lot of problems is because of self. Which, kind of, you know, we all have elements of it and it, 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 it boils over sometimes, don't it? Oh, not me. I'm perfect in every degree. <clears throat> no, I've been around too long. We all come from the same stump. And it ain't a fat lighter stump either. All right, so. I learned a long time ago that I can kill a lot of people, but I can't kill myself. You know, I mean, I nailed this to the cross and nail my feet to the cross, but I've always got this hand to get into trouble. So I need you guys, see, to finish the job. Come on, smile at me or do something. <laughs> we need each other because there's some things that we just won't do because we don't want to die in certain areas. getting hot in here. <laughs> you know, ain't no need to get mad at the person that God's using to finish you off. Except, see, see, except a seed fall into the ground and die it abideth alone. I have Susan B. ministered this, this was years ago. We, this, this old woman, bless her heart, she was, I loved her, but she was in bad shape. Why don't my kids come and visit me? I look at Susan, she looks at me. We have pity. And I knew, she knew why, and I knew why. How many understand what I just said and I didn't say anything? <laughs> Always finding fault. Ain't nobody going to be hanging around you if, if that's all you're going to do. How many love me now? On this side, half the other <laughs> I'm speaking truth, even though we don't, don't like that truth so much. I had one, I'm not going that one. Let's finish this up. Okay. So Paul says, I, I face death every day and die to myself. People in your family do certain things and, do you, and, and, and it brings death to you. How many? Let's see your hands. Huh? Yeah. I don't know how some of you keep a, a, a straight face. I, I just don't know. I, I, don't, yeah, I think you're scared to smile. You might crack a little bit, you know. Boy, can I just share one of mine? I have a great grandson. I love him. I really do. I really love him. He's wrecked two cars in just three months. I helped him, you know, to have, get the first one. 
I do you write that one? I said, I love you some, but I can't help you. So his mama helps him get another car. Now you wreck that one. How do you handle that? Hmm? Without losing your hair. <laughs> but see, you've got to release that to God. You've got to know how to release. Turn it loose. Remember we were talking about turn it loose. Turn it loose. Turn it loose. Everybody say turn it loose. You better. You'll go down if you don't. Okay. So he died every day, Paul did. And, and you'll find there's times. That, and let me say, you, you win some and you lose some. Everybody say, you win some. You win some. And you lose some. You lose How many, some. most of you look like you won more than you lost. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Five more minutes and I'll let you go. All right, here we go. Go to the next verse, see what Paul's got to say. What do I gain if merely from the human point of view, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised at all, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will be dead. And that's the end of it. Make sure you understand that. What do I gain if I merely from a human point of view, fight wild beasts in Ephesus, if the dead are not raised at all, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will be dead. And that's the end of it. That's what he's saying. Can you see it? How many sees it? All right. He does all of this to come to that point. Now go to the next one. Do not be so deceived and misled. Evil companionship, com communion, association, corrupt and debrave good manners and morals and character. Now... And so what he, the reason he's putting that in there, because some of these people are hanging around some folks that don't believe in resurrection, and it's corrupting their belief, and he's trying to correct it all. And so you, you may have to get away from them folks, if you can. And you know, you can't get away from everybody, especially if you're married. To death to us depart. <laughs> Let's have about two minutes of, of, of questions now. What, what's, did, did, is there any picture formed in your mind tonight? Did I help you any? Very little, right? But, but you see, this, when you're reading the scriptures, how Paul talks, and you have to bring it all together to understand it, basically he's simply saying, hey, if you don't believe in a resurrection, if there is no resurrection, we have no hope. <laughs> we might as well drink and get drunk and forget about it. Next morning we go with a headache. But there is a resurrection. So remember that sometimes you may ask the question, why, why is this all happening? There is a resurrection and there are rewards that God does give. And sometimes the enemy may put doubt in your mind, but cast those imaginations down in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring every thought into obedience of Christ. Thank God there is a resurrection. And I just preached my niece's funeral last week. And that's the hope that I had in my heart, knowing that there she is with Jesus forevermore and don't have to worry about anything on this old world because everything down here is but a vapor. It's a, not even hardly a dot on the radar screen. As you get older, you understand that a little bit more. And I can't believe that at my age, and I, can't, I, I don't mean to keep bringing it up, but I'm 84, and I'm saying, wait a minute, where, where, where did my life go? Whew. Here I am, 84. And it's like, wow, it's hard to believe. But when you're young, say, you know, I mean, somebody 50 years old is old folk. How many is 50 in here? Let's see the 50s. One, two, three. How many 50s in, in that range? 50 or 60 or 70? How many we got in here? Okay. Do, do you consider yourself old? Huh? <laughs> Encourage one another with this. 
that there is a resurrection and the Lord's coming back. Hallelujah. And we're going to be caught out of this thing just like that. Don't doubt. Just continue to believe and trust the Lord. And let's just stay busy and love one another and continue to follow him each day of our life. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And I give you praise and glory for all your goodness. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless.